Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Broadcom. My name is Cody and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. We have an exciting presentation ahead, but before we dive into things, I have just a couple of notes I'd like to review with everyone. First of all, we are, of course, recording today's session. So if you miss any of our discussion, if you'd like to rewatch, or if you'd like to share with your team, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand shortly after we conclude this live session today. Now, if you'd like to get involved with us, there are a couple of ways to do so. The first way to chat with us is via the chat tab on the right side of your screen. So when you find that tab, I'd like you to let us know from where in the world you're joining us from today. Now, if you have specific questions, we do want you to submit those questions to the Q&A tab. We'll be holding most questions until the end, um, so be sure to send in your question when you have it, and we'll do our best to address as many as we can toward the end of the hour. Um, additionally, if you jump over to that handout section, you'll see there's a 2023 DORA report infographic, and that's going to be kind of the basis of, of what our conversation is built upon today. So feel free to grab that. It's there in the handouts for you. And we will be selecting two of our most engaged attendees today to receive $50 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to chat, send in questions, and of course, fill out our survey. All of those will make you eligible for our giveaway. So our topic today is key findings from this year's Accelerate State of DevOps report. And I'm joined today by Kim Castillo, Staff User Experience Program Manager at Google. And we are joined by Beverly Mendel, DevOps Program Leader at Broadcom. So Kim and Beverly, thank you both so much for joining us on Tech Strong Learning. Kim, do you want to dive us right into what this report's all about? Sure thing. Hey, everyone. My name's Kim, like Cody said. Um, I'm joined by Beverly today from Broadcom. Um, really glad to be here. And you know what? I'm excited because uh, this research has been around for nine years. Uh, and working in Dora, it, it's probably one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my career. It marries a lot of things that I'm very passionate about. So I lead the research uh, at Pro programmatically at Dora. Uh, we're both a research and advocacy program. So we not only want to do hard science on the research, but we also want to make sure that people know what this research means to them so that they can apply that into their respective organizations. So we want everybody to improve. Um, what I'll cover today, which I'm very excited about, uh, like Cody alluded to, are the key takeaways from our research this year. So this is for 2023. We have takeaways from every year, but this year is kind of one of our most exciting yet. It's our longest report, and we have some really fun stuff to share with you. Um, I want to cover a little bit about the research. What's the context? What are the dimensions we look at? And then I want to touch briefly on four key measures. This is something that Dora is renowned for. Uh, we are known specifically because we have metrics for how you measure software delivery performance. So let's talk about that a little bit. But first, the research. So DORA is really one of a kind research of it uh, in the technology space. Before DORA, there really wasn't anything that looked into uh, from a research perspective or like with hard data. What does it mean for software teams to perform really well? And when it was founded, the best way to do this was to look at relationships between capabilities, technology capabilities in some regard, but it could be different kinds of capabilities. Um, we look at capabilities and how they lead to certain outcomes. Now, for this year, year's report, for this year's re research, we're really exploring three key outcomes or categories of outcomes, namely organizational performance. We look at team performance and employee well-being. So let's talk about organizational performance first. So you might think, hey, if your organization is making top dollar, you have high revenue, this is organiza organizational performance. But that's not the only thing we count as organizational performance. You can have commercial success, but you may not be providing value for your customers. You may not be providing value for the extended community. So we look at those dimensions as well. And the reason for that is because this research looks at a gamut of different organizations from startups to enterprise, 
across different industries. So finance, education, government, you name it. Um, and when we look at organizational performance in such a wide spectrum of types of organizations, we just don't look at commercial success. So we look at other things as well. But commercial success is important too. Um, and then we look at the system. And what the system is for us is really like team performance and employee well-being. Like how are we as humans doing as part of the system that contributes to software and organizational performance? So for team performance, this is really the ability uh, of an application or service to create value, innovate, and collaborate. So you think about your favorite product in the market out there, there's a team behind that that has created that value and innovated in that space for you. So we look at that as part of team performance. And then we look at employee well-being. These are the people, the nuts and bolts that actually help you deliver these things. And so we look at strategies that organizations or teams employ that would best benefit their employees. So are they doing things like reducing burnout? Are they fostering a satisfying job experience? Are they increasing people's ability to provide valuable outputs, which in some regard is actually productivity for us? So, you know, if a person could be working, but they may not be, you know, they're just busy, busy working, but they're not really giving you a valuable output. So for us, productivity is when a person is at the highest level of performance as, an, as a human being. So you need to be able to show up at work 100%. And with that, this research is basically like looking at a multifaceted way of measuring performance across the board. So we hope that this research at the end of the day is something you take away, like whether you're a leader or a practitioner and get a sense of where you can make the best impact. So we're really thankful for everybody who take the survey year over year and read our report and give us feedback every year as well. So I wanna move on to software delivery performance, these four key measures. And like, I just wanna revisit this because this is something that people like, they look at everything in the report and they're like, I just want to measure how well we're doing. And the best way for me to do that is to measure how well our software delivery is. But again, I want to emphasize software delivery is just one part of the system. It's one way to deliver value. Yes, it is very cool that technology enables different sectors now, nonprofit, name it. But, you know, so this, this is important to look at, but I just want to mention very very tangently that this is actually a big part, but it is part of the system. So let's talk about a little bit on the, these different keys of measures for software delivery performance. So the first is this change lead time concept. What do we mean by this? How long does it take for a change to go from committed from a computer that a developer has hands on keyboard, put in code from that point to get deployed into production. That that is what we mean by lead time, uh, lead time for changes because it varies across the board in different organizations. We also look at deployment frequency, how frequently changes are pushed to production. So we've heard of those famous six month deliveries to production. They'll name it some kind of like uh, H1, V1 or for that first half of the year and then they'll have another release in the second half of the year. Um, we also look at that, and there are reasons people do that, but uh, for high-performing teams, we find that deployment frequency is a lot higher, actually. Um, we also look at change failure rate. This is how frequently a deployment introduces a failure that requires immediate intervention. So what's your intervention, uh, or what is your uh, incident response uh, culture within your organization? We look at that as well. Uh, and lastly, the failed deployment recovery time. So somewhat related to the last one, but this has more to do with how long it takes to recover from a failed deployment. And then we also look at things like, what are your practices around it, like RCAs? Or how, you know, how do you make sure that you safeguard for future development? Uh, so this is really cool because you can use this for any type of technology that you're delivering. It doesn't matter if it's the latest and greatest AI model, that you want to push out, 
or if it's your mainframe application that your shipping changes about. Um, the, these four metrics across any of those applications can be used. So just a quick snapshot of what uh, we want to convey to people as high performing teams. We really see that the top performing teams are balanced teams. They have high team performance, low burnout, high organizational performance, and high job satisfaction. So I touched on that a little bit earlier. And we have kind of some benchmarks for top performance here. So for top performers, deployment frequency on demand, lead time for change, less than a day, change failure rate, 5% and failed deployment recovery time, less than an hour. These are aspirational stuff, by the way. So we want you to choose where you are in the journey. Like maybe for this point of your journey, you wanna um, work on your deployment frequency. Maybe there are things that you're better at than the others, but these are ways that we sort of give benchmarks for uh, some of the top performers across the industry. So we kind of laid that all down. And really, you, when you look at the data, four clusters of performance emerge uh, across these four metrics that I mentioned. Uh, like always, applications in each cluster exhibit similar performance characteristics and each cluster is sufficiently different from the others. So really this is just a way to give you sort of a, a gradient of performances. Now, also in our analysis, we look at how we cluster teams and where they're strongest at. So this year, we're really looking at user centricity. And that's something I just want to emphasize from this slide. Um, teams that focus on the needs of users are better equipped to build the right thing. So combining user focus with software delivery performance and operations performance means those teams are also equipped to build the right thing. So just think about that. We have a whole section in the report that talks to you about the value of thinking more of a product, thinking more for your user and have, having empathy for your user. So again, user centricity is critical for organizational success, team performance and employee well-being. And we also found that uh, if you don't know who you're building for, the org, the team and the, the employees will certainly struggle. So let's move on to the exciting stuff, the six key takeaways. I'll breeze through these really fast. So six things that we want to convey to you right now, healthy culture. So all tech process and capabilities wouldn't get you very far with unhealthy culture. Now people rack their brains like, what do you mean healthy culture? Like these are, there's several ways to measure this in, in our research. And really we talk a little bit about generative cultures, like cultures that enable some of flexibility, uh, enable knowledge sharing. And so this is really some ways we evaluate culture. But another thing we really look at in order to transform, make this more applicable, is that we look at how do you change? What are the enablers of change? And changing the tools and processes is are one way to do that. You look into your tools and your processes, do a change management. These are ways that you change culture. Uh, now let's look at user centricity. I know I've been harping about this again and again, but again, this is really a key finding from this year. Teams that focus on the user have 40% higher organizational performance, 40%. That is a big uh, change agent right there. So we detail this in a whole chapter of the report, like I said. Now, quality documentation. So for the third year in a row, we've seen that documentation has immediate positive outcomes for your organization. So what we call Endora, basically, we say documentation is like sunshine. It helps things grow. And quality documentation not only leads to these favorable outcomes, it establishes technical capabilities. Like your developers will actually get better at their work with quality documentation. Then we saw that flexible infrastructure is really an enabling factor for organizational performance. So we don't only look at whether or not you have it, but how do you actually use flexible infrastructure? And we found that infrastructure, flexible infrastructures lead to 30% higher organizational performance across the board. So you may have cloud without flexible infrastructure. This actually has a negative effect. Um, 
But at a bare minimum, you need to have that flexible infrastructure in place in order to improve those outcomes. And then here we have distribute work, work fairly. Uh, so we found that people who self-identified as underrepresented women and genders and people who are underrepresented have higher levels of burnout, 24, 24%. And this is because they have more toil and less recognized work. So in our research, we looked at something called non-promotable tasks. People could be toiling away in uh, really menial work that doesn't feel rewarding and actually is not going to be what will advance them in their career. And that leads to burnout, naturally. So people who identify uh, in this group do 29% more repetitive work than those who do not. And what we're saying here, I label this as distribute work fairly, because this is how we want to make it practicable for people to actually offset some of these, uh, the burnout that these people experience. Try to look at your teams and how is work being distributed across them. So rethink and reshuffling and enable a little bit of learning so that people can start advancing in their careers or advancing their skills. And then lastly, we put code reviews. And we want to emphasize the fact that this is kind of an easy way to, not e easy way, but like this is kind of a quick and dirty way to get immediate outcomes. So teams with faster code reviews have 50% higher software delivery performance. Um, seems kind of obvious, but improving on this is actually a big way to make immediate changes or immediate improvements right away. So go into your retrospectives, talk about how you can optimize code reviews. If it's already fast, great. Uh, it's not already a bottleneck, but if it's not fast enough, then this is one area you can definitely optimize for. So those are the six key takeaways. Just flash them in your memory for now. Um, but yeah, we have all this detail in the report. Finally, I just want to, um, you know, give you kind of an idea of the breadth of this report. Uh, this year, we actually had 3.6 more organic responses from our survey participants, uh, which means that we have deeper analysis this year. Uh, so we're really glad that people in the industry are still paying attention to us, taking our survey and reading the report. Uh, and this uh, data is actually 50% of the participants have 15 years of experience. So you, you can trust that there are people who are taking the survey and taking stock of all their experiences as well in this industry. And then lastly, 40% of participants are from organizations with 5,000 more, uh, 5,000 upwards employees. And with that, um, I guess this is, you know, my close, um, join our community, Dora.community. We encourage you to touch other practitioners, uh, talk to them, tell you, uh, tell them about your experiences, and you know, workshop some of that. And with that, I, you know, I'm happy to take uh, take myself off presentation mode and uh, hand it over to uh, Beverly. I believe you're on mute right now. Mute. There you go. There we go. Hi, everyone. Round two. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Is, um, is that correct? OK, I'm going to assume yes. Well, Kim, this is a uh, really interesting. I find this research fascinating and excited to join you today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Beverly Mindel. I'm from Broadcom. Broadcom is a market leading provider of DevOps solutions used by hundreds of top enterprise customers. And so excited to share with you more. Today, we're going to talk about, I'm just making sure the screen is moving. It is. Um, our perspective on the uh, State of DevOps report and also talk about how Broadcom solutions can help address key areas of the DORA findings. So let's talk about the kind of a summary of some of the themes that we saw from the report. There's a lot of different practices that it discusses. And so we kind of boiled it down to recap a few themes. The first being that flexible infrastructure and technical practices 
And these include things like speed of code review, loosely coupled architecture, continuous integration. These improve your software delivery performance. Another thing we saw is culture and quality of documentation impacts the technical capabilities that allow you to improve organizational performance. Moving on, a balanced team with that user-centric view can help optimize your delivery speed, your operational performance, and your reliability. And then the last one is that the change failure rate, which is how often right, a, a deployment introduces a failure where you have to intervene immediately, is still really high, greater than 15% for half of all organizations. And what that means is we see that organizations continue to struggle with balancing that velocity, that lead time for change with that quality. And we might ask why. And one reason has to do with waste. Many organizations have not optimized their testing. So asking, are, is what you're testing right? Does it match what your users are doing with the application? Are you testing negative scenarios, edge cases? Do you understand the impact of these changes? Are you over testing in areas that you know you have you know are not making the changes on, and it, you know perceivably under testing in the areas that are going to have the most impact based on what types of changes you're making? If you think about the test pyramid, where you have you know your business logic and unit test you know unit testing and business logic kind of lower down and UI testing at the top. Have you inverted it? So most of your tests that are uh, take longer to get the responses on and may um, be more difficult to create or run are actually the ones you're doing the most. Or do you have a, a you know, a, like a normal test pyramid? These are all questions that you can ask and challenges that many organizations have. Another challenge that we see is pipeline environment friction. So organizations have made a lot of advancements in flexible infrastructure and loosely coupled architecture to support rapid provisioning of environments. But this doesn't mean that environment setup is always done correctly. And having secure on-demand environments is difficult and making sure everything is routed to right, the right services and the deployments don't have anything erroneous or broken and configuration definition issues or lack of availability of a downstream dependency. And we see that organizations still continue to struggle with the proper test environment setup. Um, and so it's really important to be able to decouple these systems and eliminate those constraints. And that brings us to kind of test asset management. Um, test assets include technical documentation, test scripts, con test configurations, test data, virtual services. And as you're making rapid code changes, these are rapidly changing as well. And it becomes a challenge to keep these assets, assets updated and you know, synced across potentially hundreds of CI CD pipelines. And you could have you know, lots of different environments. You could have hybrid cloud or multi-cloud. And so it's really important and we need to do so in a way where we don't also risk PII data exposure in any of these pipelines. And then we, we sort of talked about how we're still seeing these high change failure rates. And this will slow you down as well, right? Users of applications expect them to be reliable and performant. They're not going to adopt otherwise. And so it's, and, you know, if it's important to make sure that you're not introducing these, these frequent risks to production. And of course, the meantime to recovery when you, you do have an issue is also very important when those occur. And so this really leads us to try to say, how can organizations better balance, you know, decreasing their lead time for change, but also ensuring that they're not introducing more frequent change failure rates, they also lower that. And that's key for organizations and users. And so what we know that you need to do is inject quality early on in the process. So many organizations will complete you know, their test definition work, creation of documentations, test scripts, test data, oftentimes in the CD part of the life cycle. This should really be built in as part of the CI process in order for you to be building continuously. Obviously, you also need to automate most of the provisioning of deployments and high toil work that's in the CD process. And flexible infrastructure and cloud services definitely help with that as well. Once we're confident using practices like change impact analysis, 
that we've met, you know, all of our both functionality, user functionality, but also our performance standards and, you know, kind of non-functional requirements. And we've successfully progressed the release all the way to production. We need to continue to monitor the application and provide a feedback loop on the performance. And so I just want to take a minute and kind of summarize both the findings as well as our approach. The first one having to do with the flexible infrastructure and your technical practices, right? Speed of code review, loosely coupled architecture, continuous integration, um, and how this improves software delivery. And it was noted, right, that teams with shorter code reviews have 50% better software delivery. And the question comes, so why doesn't everyone just have quick code reviews? And some has to do with practices, right? It might have to do with being able to implement work in progress limits or thinking about the batch size. Another reason has to do with bottlenecks in the system, whether environments are unavailable or it's hard to decouple or you have a challenge of having the right data to be able to fully test. And so we believe that it's really important to remove these bottlenecks in order to be able to continuously improve. The second has to do with culture and quality documentation. And culture obviously is key to long-term sustainability and growth. But what was surprising to me is that documentation can amplify technical capabilities, organizational performance, and even have positive impacts on team performance, productivity, and job satisfaction. And it's important to include documentation and system modeling practices in a continuous integration, in the continuous integration life cycle in a way that doesn't increase toil. Because you don't want folks that are actually writing the documentation to feel that they're doing manual or repetitive tasks. The third one, point that we talked about is having a balanced team with a user-centric view to optimize delivery speed, operational performance, and reliability. And thinking from a user perspective, we have to think about not only the value of what we're building and the way that a user interacts with it, but the performance and the resiliency of the solution. If something is valuable, but it does not, it, you know, it's not available or online, like users are not going to use this. And so in order to deliver quickly with long-term quality, we have to build a non-functional requirements and SRE practices. Um, because if you don't have the quality up front, it's going to end up slowing you down anyways with the need to fix it later. And you'll also lose, you know, your users as well. And then with the high change failure rate, right, half of organizations, when they introduce a change, right, they have change failure rates of over 15%, meaning they have immediate intervention at that point. And so we need to use practices to really balance the velocity and the quality. So I want to take a minute and talk about, well, how does Broadcom help? And Broadcom, we support a wide variety of DevOps tools. And we're going to take a look at a few of those tools and where they are in the life cycle. One second. All right, so I'm going to start with Rally, which is our enterprise agile management tool where we capture backlogs. And as we move up into the design, we've got Agile Requirements Designer. Um, it's our model based testing tool that can help um, kind of have a clear understanding of what is the system, help with automated test design, test automation, and test case gener generation and optimization. We're going to move on up where we see both kind of in design as well as later on, you will see layer seven. It's our API management tool for API definition, security management, and gateway functions. Service virtualization, which is used both in the CI and CD part of the life cycle, is our endpoint emulation tool for virtualizing dependencies between applications components. Again, also in the CI, but also can be used in the CD part of the life cycle as test data manager. Um, it's our automated test data provisioning, masking, and generation tool. Moving on to deploying, we have Nolio, um, our automated model-based deployment tool. And then overseeing this is Continuous Delivery Director, um, which is our release orchestration and governance tool. 
And our AI ops uh, solutions address full stack monitoring and observability. And we have other DevOps tools as well. Some, you know, in specifically also for mainframe development and environments. And you'll find a list of all of our tools, including ones not mentioned here on the Broadcom website. So we'll take a minute and deep dive into a few of these solutions. Um, I'll start with Rally. Rally is our enterprise agile and application lifecycle management solution. And it supports all the needs of agile at scale and frameworks such as SAFE. Uh, from a perspective of DevOps, it supports backlog management and it has various levels of extraction, like the agile software planning and development and execution processes. And it allows for multi-person uh, collaboration. And with capabilities around capacity planning and batch size management, teams can visualize and put all the practices in place to help encourage faster code reviews. Earlier, we talked about documentation. And so if you're thinking about how can you build documentation in your culture, how can you do that without experiencing toil, which is something that's repetitive or could have been automated, an Agile Requirements Designer can help. It's our leading model-based testing tool that allows you to start documenting from the get-go what is the intended behavior of the system uh, from a user perspective in terms of a flow diagram. And by modeling the behavior from a user or flow perspective, not only will you get clear documentation on how should the system behave, but it also reduces the toil of later manually creating test cases. Once we've defined the model, we can automate the test design to generate tests with a precise level of coverage by using various algorithms. And Agile Requirements Designer supports automated change impact analysis. So we know what tests have been impacted by any sort of model change and which ones you know, are now needed or no longer needed so that testing can be focused on where changes have been made. Automation can be provided to each area or each block so that when the test cases are automatically generated, the automation is created as well. And the automation, as you see on kind of the right-hand side, is agnostic. So you can use whatever framework you would like to use in terms of your automation. ARG can also generate the synthetic data to be aligned with the test cases, as well as any sort of uh, virtual services, so that you can decouple the environment and any sort of data constraints and be able to test early which leads on to service virtualization. So we've learned about how important flexible infrastructure, user centricity and reliability are and service virtualization can help with that. Service virtualization is an industry leading uh, product for endpoint simulation that supports on-demand environments, even when you have complex systems like mainframes or ERPs. Service virtualization helps by creating a lightweight simulator that behaves like the real endpoint so that it's easy to set up the environment that's representative of the full application landscape. And there's an incredible level of control so that you can get predictable responses, including the proper data and the delays. So you want capabilities when you're developing to be performant and reliable so that when they're in production, they are also performant and reliable there, right? So service virtualization allows you to define delays um, that perhaps represent like a range of what the live system would typically respond, or maybe you're looking at certain air conditions and you want particularly slow delays. And so you can then also decouple that back end and have performance testing done earlier in the life cycle on your, against your application to ensure the reliability of the components or the, what you're building. To continue on the theme of infrastructure, Layer 7 is a leader in API security, and it's an API management tool that is a key part of any application infrastructure. The deployment of the gateway configurations and policies can be stored and automated as part of a continuous pipeline. The API gateway allows for flexibility of infrastructure by handling the security in the management layer for the services. Developers use Layer 7 platform to collaborate and share and manage APIs. And it can also support the decoupling of dependencies for creating those on-demand environments by using policies to route between whether it's you know, the, the live or dev or virtual service endpoints that you might have created in, in service virtualization. 
both organizations and users are concerned about the privacy of you know, their user data in production. But having user-like data for development, it can often be a bottleneck to testing and being able to deliver. Test Data Manager is our best-selling product for automating test data, to, um, automating test data to support provisioning, subsetting, masking, PII protection, and synthetic generation. And it helps you ensure that you've tested the right scenarios and that you have faster test environments set up with real like data. If you can't get away from complex, in, you know, like architecture, Nolio can help. Nolio is a model based deployment automation product for supporting complex full stack deployments, whether it's mainframe microservices or mobile. It operates on a principle of model once to play everywhere. So we can create a common model to drive deployments across multiple types of environments. Continuous Delivery Director is our model-based release planning, orchestration, and automation tool. It supports visualizing the entire orchestration process and allows collaboration across multiple CI, CD functions and pipelines. You can get the data uh, collection from these processes and all different associated tools and be for a creation of analytic dashboards for the CI CD data. And that's really powerful because we can also use these heuristics and data from the pipeline to calculate a release risk based on things like your test results, the code complexity in terms of what changes have been made, the coverage of your testing, et cetera. And so CDD can provide a lot of visibility into what's happening and help orchestrate across multiple CI CD pipelines. And then going to AI ops and observability, and it's an essential contributor to the DevOps lifecycle. When we say um, AI ops, we're including a number of different solutions, including DX operational intelligence. And AI ops contributes to lifecycle by the principles of measure, monitor, prioritize, and optimize. We're going to start with measure and observe. Um, so first, we're first in class in terms of the data collection. Since this data is going to be foundation on measuring, you know, it's going to be the basis for the key performance indicators that help us track the observed environment's health, performance, and errors. It's incredibly important that this data is valid. Um, from there, we need to we need to monitor the system. Um, improving your change failure rate requires identifying the underlying causes of failure. Is, for example, let's say you had a failure, right? Is it the new problem related to a change that was made or a new release? Is it a network issue? Is it a disk scare? Is it something unrelated? So it's really important to make sure that you're monitoring and understanding. And our monitoring solution leverages AI and machine learning capabilities to correlate transaction information and map it to the business outcomes. Monitoring the data is a contributor to the prioritization. Service-driven observability holds the software lifecycle and change management accountable for those business outcomes by correlating end user experience, basically how do you deliver your services you know, to your end customers and your business statistics, excuse me, with things like air rates, downtime, and you know, your overall performance. So you can assist understanding your operational and your business stakeholders and be able to make better and faster decisions. And when we think about optimize, right, the ultimate goal here is self-healing. We want our applications to be able, you know, in the form of, you know, automation and remediation activities. And, and we do support, you know, the self-healing. Organizations will typically start, though, with understanding their historical data and their mean time to resolution data in order to kind of prioritize that. But I just want to note, operations is often forgotten, but it is a central part of the tool set and the, de the DevOps lifecycle. While operations used to be kind of a, a very centralized function, like that's not the case anymore. And individual teams are often responsible and are using our tools to help them maintain application performance. 
The goal of Google's research is really to drive the improvements of software delivery practices and improve organizational team operational and reliability practices. And this is the DNA of what we do at Broadcom. However, we're aware that technical capabilities are a piece of the puzzle and culture is integral as well, which is also clear in the report. And so we do a number of activities with our customers to improve their maturity. These activities can range from things like DevOps workshops, collaborative events like user conferences and office hours, best practice you know, webinars and other continued education. And we are invested in the continued success of the organizations that we support. So Cody, I think we are, we've got a little bit of time. I think we'll be able to answer, answer some questions. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Awesome, Beverly. So um, to our audience, go ahead and send in any questions that you might have, and we've got plenty of time here to tackle them. Um, so it looks like we do have this question so far. How do your methodologies differ when developing for everything at the service versus on-prem applications? So that's an interesting question. I, th I, I think I'll also, I guess I jumped in, so I guess I will start, and then Kim, I'll let you you speak as well. Um, so I think there, there's obviously huge benefits if you're able to simplify your environment and decouple those dependencies, which on-prem applications may have more challenges around. So when you say, how do your methodologies differ? I think you have to look at what are your bottlenecks? What are you struggling with? And that's going to help lead to how do those methodologies differ. Um, but a lot of the practices that you're using to decouple are still valid um, in, in the different ways that you might approach it. You still do need to look at the overall cycle. I think the methodology in terms of thinking about how do you look at your users, how do you get the feedback, how do you optimize, are still valid whether or not you have a more complex, complex infrastructure or not. So that's really how I kind of would look at it is some of the complexity and challenges you may have to deal with in a different type of way, but the overall of what are you trying to do and solve for and how can you optimize is still valid um, whether you have kind of a um, on-premise application or SaaS. Uh, Kim, do you have anything? I'm sure you have more to add to that as well. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we found in the report that um, on-premises infrastructure is still a popular option for organizations and has a lot to do with security or compliance requirements. So, you know, like I, I would plus one everything you said, Beverly, is that there are dependencies in those situations and we understand why organizations do them. Uh, and really like, it, it really is, uh, the, there are constraints that you have to work with. So looking into how, what your processes are to support that kind of infrastructure, like what are ways you could remove any bottleneck in that system, uh, given that those are your constraints. So that's really like, when we talk about top performers in our, um, in our report, we're really just looking at clusters of patterns of data that emerge from the respondents that we get. Um, so when we see kind of the outcomes from their side, um, obviously, like some organizations may be less constrained in, in certain ways. Uh, they have a lot more flexible infrastructure or they have a lot more freedom to self-serve. Um, so those are things that, you know, we're not necessarily comparing teams that these are better than others. That's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say that um, there are ways in which we you can improve uh, and and get to higher benchmarks. And, you know, we would even challenge that for on premises uh, type of applications. Yeah, I, I would and expect it, right? I mean, the, that's an expectation. There are practices to put into place to be able to support decoupling. And so, um, you know, strong performing organizations are able to do that. But we, we do recognize that there may be constraints depending on kind of 
you know, your, your organization and, and the platform that you're on. And so you have to, you have to live within those, right? Well, it, it looks like that is all the questions that we have received so far today. Um, but Kim and Beverly, I do want to give each of you an opportunity to leave our audience with any parting words or any final thoughts before we really well, start well, shutting things before down. Before we do, and I may be putting okay. Kim on the spot, is if that's okay. Um, you know, Kim, one topic that I thought was interesting and um, that I think others might as well is, you know, there was in the report a little bit of information about, you know, AI, right? And I know that that's a very popular topic. And so I was wondering if maybe we could take a minute or two, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, apologies for that. But I think that the folks on might be really interested in what did the report have to say? Because I know some of the, you know, findings were a little bit surprising to me, especially given how popular, you know, that topic is in the industry. Yeah, so I'll I'll give you a little bit of kind of the backdoor view from our, from our end, you know. Um, so we know AI is a hot topic, and we know we're coming in very very early, and we know that because um, that's how the data came back. It's that um, we're very early in the journey when it comes to AI. So I just want to point out first of all that. Um, our principle or our philosophy in Dora is that we're platform and tool agnostic, first of all. So just keep that in mind. Now, um, in terms of that, um, tools, uh, so it's not possible to draw conclusions about specific tools. And we think about AI as that. It's, it's just one of these tools. Now, um, in terms of what how the data came back to us, you know, we're just seeing kind of a positive, um, you know, effect, you know, we're seeing 50% improvement uh, in terms of the well being of people who are using AI for the first time. But again, like we're kind of very early in the journey, and in terms of enterprise adoption or organization wide adoption, uh, we're not seeing like that as of yet. So when we started collecting this data, this was back in June, and we closed this survey around June, July. Um, from that month all the way to when we published the report October, there were massive changes in this space. So we could be looking at like just the the benchmark from that period. We're gonna look at it again next year and we're gonna see massive changes in the data as well as they come back. So really this is our baseline. This is the first time we're looking at it. But the most important thing I wanna say is as you do incorporate AI, um, the DORA software delivery metrics, you know, gives you a way to measure these meaningful outcomes that you're looking for. So you can still assess the impact of incorporating AI in the long run in terms of how that's still software you're developing and you're still trying to measure performance around that. So that's kind of our stance around that. I don't know if that answers your question, Beverly. Yeah, no, I, I think, thank you. Yeah, the, the main thing is we do see moderate improvements to employee well-being and the use of AI. That's a good start. Uh, but beyond that, we expect it to take more time for these tools before we see any meaningful impact on organizations. And maybe it's already there, but we're going to look at it again next year. Absolutely. And it could be that organizations are still trying to figure that out, right? They haven't figured out how to maximize the benefits. So they're not necessarily going to see that, which you sometimes see when you're exploring something new or POCing something, right? You're taking a small amount of time to learn something and you, it may not yet, I mean, you may be making a, an informed decision, right? On, on how or if um, it can impact, you know, positively on your organization. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's an emerging capability as far as we're concerned from a research perspective. Um, it has a lot of promise. It's got tremendous promise um, and fully leveraging it requires changes to processes, tooling, team workflows, etc. So, you know, there are a number of things that need to change in order to adopt any type of new technology.
All right. Well, we are officially out of questions, guys. Um, so I again, I do want to give you each opportunity to, to leave us with any parting remarks before we close things down. Um, Beverly, would you like to get us started there since you happen to be unmuted? Oh, sure. Happy to happy to do so. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time today. As I mentioned, this is very interesting. This is core to what we do. And we want to make sure organizations really are successful and putting the user first is incredibly important to that. It's why I got into product development uh, as well. Um, you know, I was frustrated if, um, you know, when uh, if I didn't see things meet the needs of what users needed and when things were, were designed without that user in mind. Um, and so, and also thinking about how can you improve your practices? So it's an area that I love. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more about any of the Broadcom solutions, please feel free to reach out as well. Happy to share more. I guess my shameless plug is, uh, you know, come join our community, uh, Dora.community. That's the, the place that uh, we would like to talk to you about these things and continue the conversation. Um, the main thing that I want folks to take away from, you know, this almost decades long research report is that, you know, we want folks to adopt a mindset of and practice of continuous improvement. And those are really, that's really what this is all about uh, for best outcomes. And um, when you think about capabilities you want to adopt and improve, you know, just think of them as dials that you can turn up, turn down, um, depending on where you are in your journey. And those actually is what is what matters at the end of the day is the effort you put into this continuous improvement. So, you know, uh, we're here for you. We're, we're here for you as practitioners as well as researchers, and we're happy to stay in touch. All right. Well, thank you, Kim. And thank you, Beverly. It's been such a pleasure meeting you and, and speaking with you today. So thank you both so much for joining us here on Tech Strong Learning. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Thanks for having us. Of course. Before everyone logs off, just a couple of things. Uh, one, if you check out that handout section, you'll see there is a report infographic and a link to the full report will be emailed to you after the webinar concludes. So keep an eye on your email for that. Um, so just a quick reminder that our session today was recorded. You will be receiving an additional email from this webinar that will include the recording that we've captured today. Um, you can also find it living on the DevOps website. That's devops.com slash webinars, and it will be in the on-demand section. As an additional reminder, we will be selecting two of our most engaged attendees today to receive a $50 Amazon gift card. And I would like to thank Broadcom for sponsoring our program today and, and having Kim and Beverly come here and, and speak with us today. So to the whole team, thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining. We appreciate you joining us here at Tech Strong Learning. Have a great day and you may now disconnect.